Lecture 13 for Western Civ 1 Germanic Contributions to Western Civilization As we begin today and we think about Germanic contributions, I'd like to have uh, just share with you something of a devotional thought. As Christians, we're called to be a distinctive people who live holy lives and to be different from people in the world. We can see ourselves in something of an analogous situation with the ancient Israelites. As we read in the book of Colossians, what we find is that uh, we're supposed to have a different mindset. That we should set our minds on things above, not on earthly things. And uh, we need to be transformed. We need to execute whatever belongs to our earthly nature, whether it's sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, and the like. But uh, what we've seen is that in the church sometimes people have brought some of their cultural baggage with them and that's changed the face of the church as far as how people see it certainly uh, there was something of a, a romanization of the church that took place and uh, in the process uh, the glory of the gospel was sometimes obscured as we move on we find that Rome falls we'll find that other people groups will bring their cultural baggage and uh, along the way, we'll see here today something of the Germanization uh, that takes place in Christendom uh, and uh, the changes that happen in society. But something we want to recognize is that uh, the gospel is for all people. And as we go on there in Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse 11, we find that in the kingdom of God, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds us all together in perfect unity. Well, what we're going to see is that uh, there wasn't always perfect unity. Certainly there's division that happens between Aryan Christians and Orthodox Christians in regard to their understanding of the nature of God. And uh, there's a lot of violence that takes place. But in Christ, we can be one in spite of our cultural differences and uh, in spite of our linguistic differences and our various mindsets. But the goal here is to become one with Christ, to develop this mind of Christ, one which is uh, humble. And uh, what we're going to find is that this would be something that the Germans, like the uh, Romans before them, had difficulty in doing. And sometimes they kept certain baggage along the way. As we start thinking about Germanic contributions to Western civilization, I would like to think a little bit, first of all, here about sources. How do we know about these early Germanic peoples. Uh, they weren't a terribly literate group of people. They didn't have a lot of writing from early on that's preserved for us. Uh, but what we do find is that the Romans preserved some description of them as they came into contact with them on their frontiers and they warred against them for many years. And so we find Tacitus gives us some insights into, Ro into Germanic society from a Roman perspective. Uh, he sees them as fine physical specimens, but people who have some rather uh, off-putting cultural traits. Their ideas about personal hygiene didn't include going to the baths every time you could to enjoy getting a nice uh, rub down with uh, scented olive oil and have it scraped away and to go to the tepidarium and uh, the uh, caldarium and the you know sweat out all the uh, uh, the contaminants from your pores. Um, these were people who found it interesting to comb their hair using butter, which of course soon went rancid. And uh, so they didn't smell good to the Romans. But if we move on, what we find is there's lots of uh, descriptions of Germanic people, particularly when they come into conflict with the Romans. But uh, we don't find too much about them until later times when we have uh, Latin writers oftentimes writing about them uh, from outside. And uh, so we'll have important sources from the 6th century written by people like Gregory of Tours, who writes a history of the Franks. Or later on, we have the Venerable Bede writing in England uh, more than a century later, uh, writing about uh, the 
church history of the Anglo-Saxon people, and within the, that he talks a lot about the uh, Germanic peoples, these Angles and Saxons and Jutes who had come uh, to what we subsequently would know as the British Isles. So when it comes to sources, we're rather uh, hard put to find materials, and what we find is that these Germanic people didn't have the richness of uh, uh, cultural artifacts that were durable that were left behind. Uh, they would embrace iron technology, but iron's a very reactive metal, so it oftentimes rusts away and there's not much to be found. They didn't build great big cities. Uh, they didn't have some of the infrastructure that the Romans had, but they certainly were quick learners. And this would be perhaps one of their contributions that they make to Western civilization that's very, very important, is that they learned how to grab things from other cultures and to embrace them when they worked for them. They're very pragmatic. So there's a lot of uh, years, centuries, where there's contact between the Romans and the Germanic peoples who lived on the frontiers. And they learned along the way as there was cultural exchange across the boundaries. Uh, these boundaries weren't impenetrable. Trade took place. Ideas moved back and forth. And so the Germanic people, as they came within the Roman Empire to invade it, uh, particularly we think about being in the 4th and 5th century, were already very much influenced by Roman culture. They'd embraced many things already. And as they took things, they oftentimes adapted them to their purposes. And as a result, uh, what we're going to find is that they were very efficient soldiers who were sometimes prized as mercenaries who would fight to support the Roman Empire and would even be allowed within the Roman Empire, as we saw with the Visigoths coming in in the fourth century. Uh, but they would take offense at their mistreatment by those Romans who were allegedly Christian when they're being fed dog meat and uh, rise up against the Roman Empire and uh, uh, challenge its great armies successfully. How did they do that? Well, they had iron technology and they had weapons that they learned from the Romans, but uh, these people were fierce warriors and this would be something that they contribute uh, to Western society as something of a glorification of war. Uh, this is going to be an important contribution that they make as uh, their glorification of war, which is seen in the various stories that they told, uh, what they valued to be a great warrior was right there at the top. Now, there have been earlier people groups like uh, the Mycenaeans and uh, Greeks and Romans, certainly, that had valued war and glorified war at times. But uh, the Germans uh, are particularly interested in war and are going to influence Western society and their ideas about war along the way. The Germans uh, who came into the Roman Empire learned about things, uh, but they learned enough sometimes to be able to overthrow the Roman Empire. And uh, sometimes we get the idea that the Germans' overthrow of the Roman Empire was all bad. There are some good things that come from the collapse of the Roman Empire and some of its institutions, which uh, basically had kind of grown used to doing things in a certain way and had get, gotten stuck in a rut in uh, development, particularly as the Romans had embraced slavery and uh, many Christians within the Roman Empire had continued to see slavery as something that was normal. And as a result, they weren't terribly inventive in the Roman Empire. And uh, they depended a lot upon uh, people that they oppressed. There were lots of social inequities, financial inequities between the countryside and the cities. Uh, the countryside basically helped to support the cities at great expense. And uh, what happens with the coming of the German peoples and the fall of the Roman Empire is that uh, there are certain equities that are regained. So the fall of the Roman Empire isn't the worst of things. Uh, certainly it upset people's apple cart, but it would allow uh, Western society to uh, make changes and to embrace new ideas along the way. Uh, so there's, there's good things as well as bad things that come with the fall of the Roman Empire. And the Germans make some positive contributions as well as uh, some false trails that, for people to follow in Western society also. But what I've highlighted here so far, at least I want to highlight, is that they were open to new ideas. They embraced ideas that the Romans had and they were willing to make changes. But they brought certain baggage with them culturally 
as they came to dominate the Roman Empire. As first those Visigoths came and, uh, towards Rome, uh, then to be followed by the Ostrogoths, and people coming from other parts of Europe, uh, up in the north, the coming of the Franks, and the Burgundians, the Almani. Uh, there's lots of different Germanic groups that uh, invade. When Roman control breaks down, when they can no longer sustain their frontier defenses, and uh, they're vulnerable to the migration of these Germanic peoples from the north. One of the ideas that they brought, as I've already highlighted, was uh, their focus on war. They're very warlike people, and uh, uh, their ways of doing war, particularly as they were centered around uh, war leaders, would be something that would be very influential in the years that followed of the Middle Ages, as a war band leader would have his comitatus, his war band of loyal soldiers. The Germans were very, very much interested in personal loyalty, in the taking of oaths. This would be something to be very, very important to them. Uh, but even as you fought for a, uh, a warlord, the expectation was that your services would be rewarded and that there was something of a, a mutual relationship between uh, individuals within a war party. This would continue over into their areas of uh, like government. They believed that there was something of a contractual relationship between rulers and those who ruled, their subjects. Uh, it's not just that a person ruled and did whatever they wanted. They basically maintained their right to rule by serving their subjects. Now what we see in the Old Testament is that Israelites had something of a concept of the uh, uh, king as being a shepherd, a servant to the flock. But uh, this is something that the Romans had certainly put to the side. They may sometimes have given lip service to the idea, but uh, they basically ruled oftentimes for themselves, and their subjects were to serve them, and they uh, forgot that there's sometimes payback that they could get, as there might be revolutions that could take place. But the idea that in government there's a relationship between rulers and subjects that's uh, should be mutually beneficial is an idea that will be very influential in the later Middle Ages with the development of feudal society. As well as uh, government then, there's also ideas about law and uh, how one keeps from having uh, blood feuds where one family member gets killed and then other families avenge themselves. The Romans uh, certainly had laws that uh, protected against that. People were under the law. But something that the, the uh, Germans particularly bring to the table was the idea of Vergeld, the idea of a valuation being given for a person. Now, as we think about people, we think about them being valuable, but uh, the Germans didn't see all people as being equally valuable. Uh, depending upon your age, your marital status, uh, your gender, uh, there could be different values that were given to a person. And the basic idea was that you could prevent blood feuds by paying a family a price uh, for their loss, the loss of productivity and service that that person made to their community. And as a result, you can keep away from having uh, blood feuds. In Germanic uh, society, they also had some interesting ways of determining innocence or guilt particularly the idea of uh, trial by ordeal, where, for example, you might prove your innocence by being able to reach into a boiling pot of water into which a ring had been cast, and it was uh, roiling around in the hot water, and you could reach in and take your hand out without the meat being boiled off your bones. Uh, well, they would move this into other areas where you could prove your innocence by... Uh, engaging in battle. And so we'll find that something will continue on in the uh, medieval times uh, is the idea of trial by battle, where someone's innocence can be proven by going to battle. And that will continue on where people's honor comes to be at stake, even into 19th century American society, where we find amongst uh, gentlemen of the South that there was a sense of honor that had to be satisfied. 
and there was dueling that went on and uh, even claimed the lives of some famous American uh, politicians along the way. Where is this sense of uh, you know, overweening uh, concern about honor come from? Well, uh, the Germans bring some of this to Western society. The um, different ideas about how you determine innocence also would include uh, taking oaths. The Germans were very much uh, concerned about taking oaths and uh, they swore on their gods and as they come and are assimilated into the uh, uh, Christian community over long years, we're going to find that uh, their practice of taking oaths was something that would continue on in Western society. And we still take oaths today. Uh, in courts of law, we swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. We put our ha hand on something that's deemed to be valuable, on the Bible, and make such oaths. Um, well, that's something that comes out of the Middle Ages, but all that oath-taking wasn't something that was uh, uh, overtly Christian. It's something that comes out of the surrounding culture. Certainly in Jesus' day, people had taken oaths, but what we found is that in the Sermon on the Mount, there in Matthew 5 and 6, that uh, Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. What we find is that uh, in the Germanization of Christianity in Western Europe, that oath-taking came to be a very important part of society. Whether you're taking an oath to your war leader or later on your, your lord in medieval society, uh, this is something that's very much a part of Germanic society that is embraced uh, by the church uh, and uh, encouraged in many ways as they uh, have embraced some of the uh, Germanic aspects of culture. The Germans also do have some contributions that they make in regard to uh, foodstuffs. Uh, the Germans weren't the first people to invent beer. Certainly that had been something that had been developed in ancient Egypt and in ancient uh, Mesopotamia. Uh, but uh, in northern Europe, uh, where grapes don't grow, uh, Beer was a source of calories that they ingested. Uh, if there was leftover food, uh, particularly bread, they could ferment that and make a, uh, a drink which would be alcoholic. And they could uh, brew beer from various grains that they grew. And uh, they would get calories that way. And these would be an important source of uh, uh, nutrients for them. Uh, but, you know, you can do that in places where you don't have grapes. In Northern Europe, they, it's too cold and they don't grow grapes. And so that wouldn't be uh, their choice of beverage. And the Germans will bring uh, a focus upon beer, uh, whereas pr previously the, uh, the Greeks and the Romans had focused more upon wine as a beverage of choice. Uh, the alcohol in both certainly... Uh, killed the bugs, the bacteria in the water that they might otherwise consume, and uh, this would be part of the culture that they would uh, bring to Western society. Uh, this would be a social event, uh, particularly around drinking. We had seen that amongst the Greeks earlier on with their symposia and uh, various Roman parties, but the Germans also have this as part of their culture, but particularly around beer rather than around wine. So there are some aspects of uh, everyday culture that come into Western society. From their um, everyday life, uh, we'd also include language. Uh, the Germans uh, contribute significantly to the languages of Western society and vocabulary. Now different language groups and places have different amounts of influence, but uh, English is seen to be a Germanic language. While it's very much influenced by its uh, connections with the times when the Romans ruled Britain, uh, Latin does constitute a major uh, stream of words in the English language. Uh, Greek is much less than 
Latin as far as its influence, but uh, when we think about Germanic languages, what we have is we have uh, French words, which is French is a Germanic language, uh, and uh, then we also think about uh, other more clearly Germanic words. Uh, Germanic words make up at least a quarter of the English language. Uh, French lang words make up about another quarter, and Latin words another quarter. And again, Greek is particularly influential in the areas of science and theology, some other words that we derive uh, in the English language. And certainly English has been a very eclectic language. Uh, but uh, the Germanic structures in English language come from the influence of the Angles and the Saxons and the Jutes, uh, who had conquered England uh, in the 5th century after the Romans had abandoned Britain because they couldn't hold on to it any longer as they uh, retracted with the objective of protecting uh, Rome. And so uh, this would be something for the, the German uh, peoples contribute to Western civilization is certain ideas and words uh, that uh, are widely spread. Again, we, we use these words without any uh, understanding always that this is a particularly a word that has Germanic roots. Uh, but you know, even amongst the French who live closer to where the Romans' cultural center was at, we find that you know, they have words that m move from words for war. I'm thinking about particularly about the word for war. We might sometimes in English still talk about antebellum architecture. That would be uh, war, uh, sorry, architecture from before the American Civil War. And so we might talk about somebody being bellicose. Again, that's using a Latin word in the English language. But the French, uh, their word for war uh, doesn't have anything to do with that. Um, and we've adopted words in English that come from that. So we might talk about people who are guerrillas. Now, that, that's spelled differently from uh, great apes. Uh, it doesn't derive from somebody who's particularly... Uh, in some way looking like a great ape. Uh, it comes from the word guerre, uh, a French word that we think of uh, for war. Uh, these would be warriors. But you know, this is coming from a German word for war, uh, not a Latin word. So we could go digging into uh, languages just to see the influence, but what I wanted you to see here was that there is some Germanization of other languages and uh, things that are carried on, values that are carried on, and these Germanic people who came and uh, although they were first introduced to Aryan Christianity, uh, they would eventually uh, embrace Orthodox Christian understanding of the Godhead and as a result uh, would embrace aspects of Roman society and blend together. And this is something that they do, but as they, they blend and they pick up things that would advantage them along the way. As I think particularly about the Germanization that uh, sometimes has an influence on Christianity, uh, I think about uh, their oath-taking, uh, certainly as I mentioned earlier, um, but also the, uh, the focus that they have on relationships and their ideas as uh, pre-Christian people that their war leaders were something of religious leaders. They weren't the only people who had that idea. But as they came into things religiously and they made changes, they typically converted as groups. A famous example of this would be the conversion of the Frankish king Clovis, as he sort of made a bargain with God. He had married a Gallo-Roman uh, princess by the name of Clotilda, and as a Gallo-Roman person, she was a Christian, and he basically made a deal with God that if he won a battle against uh, seemingly insurmountable odds, that uh, he would convert to Christianity. And when he converted, then on that day, there were 600 other uh, Germanic warriors who served under him who were baptized also. Now, their understanding of things uh, about Jesus' lordship 
uh, they understood some things that was going to bring about some changes, but uh, uh, as I recall, uh, these individuals were baptized, and they made sure to leave their right hand out of the water when they were baptized because they still had a lot of killing to do. Uh, but they, they became Christians and embraced Orthodox Christianity because their war leader had done this. And so you have something of a group conversion. They have a, a, a group identity which will continue on, and this group identity particularly has uh, influence as they come to be Christians. They have this idea that, you know, if you're not a Christian, then you're working against the society. If you don't embrace the religion that everybody embraces, well, then uh, you're something of an uh, enemy of society. Uh, they don't have a church-state division amongst them. Now, we've seen other groups work sort of like that also, but uh, this will be one of the challenges in the later medi medieval world, uh, and it'll continue on really up until the 20th century, where in many countries in Europe that identify with uh, national leaders have a state church. Uh, we'd seen already in Rome and with Constantine and then in the Eastern Roman Empire with the Byzantines that there was a, uh, a practice of Caesaropapism where the uh, the um, political leader was also a religious leader. But this would be normative within the uh, Germanic society and uh, would continue on. So we'll find that French kings aspire to be the leaders of the French church, even though they've embraced the uh, Roman Catholic ch Church, uh, English kings will want to maintain uh, their leadership of the state church. And this will bring them into conflict at times with religious leaders like popes. Uh, so there are a number of things culturally that the uh, Germans bring as they come into the Roman Empire. Uh, that they bring from their culture, which are going to have an influence on subsequent uh, expressions of Christianity within the Latin West. But it's not all bad. Again, their openness to new ideas was something that the Romans had they'd gotten stuck in a rut. And uh, now they're more open to new ideas and new technologies, uh, making changes. The Romans had had a number of inventions, but they never really embraced them widely. To widely use the caruca, this heavy plow, that's going to help to transform Europe. When you cut through the heavy clay soils and break up those clods and aerate the soil so that new plants' roots can grow, uh, there'll be production yields that are enhanced as a result. But this is because these Germanic people are willing to embrace new technologies and do things in new ways. Uh, sometimes they would be resistant to changes. They're going to be resistant at times to Christianity, but what we're going to find is that amongst the, the monks there'll be some very dedicated persons who are going to uh, work to evangelize uh, these Germanic people, sometimes at great personal risk. Uh, they're not always going to be uh, highly moral people as uh, they accept certain things as being normative, but they do bring in some values that help to change things within the church. Um, clearly, by the year 400, uh, the Roman period monk Jerome, who translated the Bible into Latin in the Vulgate translation, had um, already embraced the idea of penance rather than Repenting, he translates certain passages to do penance. And that's going to have a great deal of influence on Christian thinking for years to come. But the idea of penance was something that the uh, the Germans embraced. The idea that you, you make payment for the wrongdoing that you've done is sort of like Vergeld. And uh, so that was something they embraced, and which is going to be very influential in the sacramental system of medieval theology. Another value they had, though, was that they particularly valued um, the um, a bloodline and being able to trace your bloodline. So they, they, while they sometimes had concubines, 
they would trace their lineage through their uh, wives and monogamy was the norm amongst Germanic peoples. That was what was culturally expected and something that they're going to do as we later on talk about the Carolinians, the Franks who lived in what we know today as France, uh, would be that they're going to promote the idea within the church that marriage is a sacrament and that marriage should be monogamous. Uh, what we found within the church is Jesus has clearly had some things that he had to say about divorce, but uh, that sometimes people played fast and loose uh, with these things, even as the Jews had at earlier times. The Germans' contributions to Western civilization have not been highlighted in uh, many people's history texts in recent years, uh, particularly uh, following World War I and then World War II. Uh, we find that amongst English-speaking peoples, the Germanic uh, contributions to Western civilization have sometimes been downplayed as something that was perhaps uh, uh, negative. But that's also in uh, reaction to earlier uh, studies of European civilization that perhaps uh, overplayed the uh, significance of Germanic con contributions, uh, particularly amongst uh, various individuals that had racist ideas that would argue about some kind of Teutonic superiority. The Germans, like others, the Romans, the Greeks, were people who lived in a fallen world, still retaining some of the image of God in themselves. They were creative and they learned how to adapt and adopt good ideas in order to overcome some of the limitations of the fallen world. But they couldn't save themselves. And what we find is that they embraced the message of Jesus when it came to them. And they'd pass that along to others. Sometimes they obscured the glory of the gospel by embracing something of a works salvation mentality that they inherited from the Romans. But their contributions continue to be evident and uh, maybe shape some of us more than others. I trust that uh, this short lecture today will hopefully make up for some of the longer ones that I've had. God bless.